Welcome to Empire Building, the podcast where we talk about building big businesses and even bigger lives. I'm your co-host, Seychelle Van Poole. And I'm Sarah Reynolds. Today, I have uh, the privilege of being able to interview uh, my amazing co-host, Seychelle, on a topic that honestly um, doesn't get talked about a lot. Uh, and one that probably needs to be talked about a lot. I think it's uh, one of those that, um, sort of like when we did that one podcast about being a female breadwinner, uh, we realized, yeah. oh, this is a topic a lot of people don't talk about. Um, and so we are going, I'm going to interview uh, Seychelle on, um, let's see, four months ago, um, Say, uh, mm-hmm. amazing father passed away. So October 17th. Um, and so we are That's four right. months in right now um, from her, her daddy passing away. And she really led her family um, during that time in terms of care, in terms of uh, conversations, hard conversations that had to be had, uh, and really taking the situation, the not fun situation. Uh, that all of us at one time in our lives will be presented with when a Mm -hmm. loved one, a family member um, needs care. And so I want to interview her on this topic on how she cared for her father. Uh, What do what did she feel she did well? Uh, What could she she have maybe done different now and in reflecting back and really dive into um, this harder conversation, but a needed one. Thank you, Sarah. It was a beautiful intro. And I just want to give a disclaimer, like we're not going to get into like any nitty gritty health stuff. So I've, I'm squeamish with things like that. So we won't get into that. But I do just want to give like a, a fair warning if, um, you know, talking about the end of life or talking about sensitive topics around um, like sick loved ones is a trigger issue for you. I just want to mm. make sure that we're giving a disclaimer today that that is, you know, would like I, I told Tara that she can ask anything. So, I, you know, we may have something pop up that might be a sensitive issue for you if that's something that triggers you. I just wanted to give you a fair warning on that. Um, but, you know, I do think this is something I wish somebody had talked about with me sooner in going through this mm. process. So for us, this is a an opportunity to pay it forward to a lot of you that have asked about like, you know, you've been in the thick of it for the past couple of years. What do you wish you would have known or what are the things that that you know, you wish you had done sooner or differently or better. So, um, I'm excited. It's excited. is probably a weird word, but I'm, I'm, um, appreciative for the opportunity to, to talk through some of those things today with you, Sarah. Well, and I think, um, it's such an important topic, right? Cause we, we love our family and those that we yeah. care for deeply and it's all part of life is mm-hmm. all of us, you know, will have, you know, my dad always says that the dates are unknown, right? Our birthday, That's right. we don't know until we're born, right? And then we don't know um, when all of us will leave this earth, but all of us will leave the earth mm-hmm. at some point mm-hmm. um, in our loved ones as well. And so it, it matters with the dash that we, um, our dash in, the, in between the dates yeah. that we don't know matters. And it gives us an opportunity to really make a difference in our loved ones' lives um, in terms of caring for them. So as we get mm-hmm. started on this, uh, my question for you is, I, I saw you sort of take the lead in the ownership mm-hmm. of this with your family. What what made you do that? Um, I think as... Um that's a great question. I think it was my gut and intuition, honestly. Um, I can, you know, I can't imagine, right? This is my dad that passed away. This is not my spouse. And so um, I can't imagine what it's like going through a terminal illness with a spouse um, and having to deal with kind of the, the anticipatory grief that surrounds that, but also the day-to-day they live with you all day every day and I think sometimes when you are in it at that level um you you don't like you don't see the things going on or progressing as quickly and the best way I could describe that is like when I lived Mm. in New York before moving back to Dallas like I would see my dad every four months during that time in my early 20s and when I would see him his his disease of Parkinson's would look like it had progressed so much more because I hadn't seen it but I think when you see Mm. somebody every day you don't see those changes as often and I you know if 
if I could go back, I would have said, you know, I think that we should have sat down and had some really hard family conversations like proactively, but we weren't. Um, and my dad would have coffee. We would get together for tea or coffee every couple of weeks on Fridays and we would have a couple of hours we would just spend together. And I think I used that as an opportunity to kind of get a gauge for how the planning was going. And, um, he, he was many things, which I love about him. He was boisterous, fun, joyous, playful. Uh, but I think in this specific topic, it was something he just didn't really want to plan for. And he didn't want to talk about it. He didn't mm. want to deal with. And I think a lot of people, when, when they're in the middle of a, a terminal illness or a diagnosis, it's really hard. You don't want to have to think about it. And so for me, I, I think just as a gut, I realized like, oh, shoot, like, you know, we ha- we're on this bus and everyone's inside having tacos and margaritas and a really good time and it's barreling towards a cliff and like, who's building the parachute and like the brakes, are the brakes mm. working? And like, do we have like, are there wings on the side? Like where, how is this, how is this actually going to land? Like, what are we doing? Um, and it just became apparent to me that that really wasn't happening. And so somebody on this bus needed to do that. And so for me, that was, I can't, I think kind of just the role I jumped into with it. I, I I love that. And I, I have been able to see your strengths shine with our work with Her Best Life. And one of um, you lean heavy on strategic thinking themes in your strengths. And I think that that shined yes. in this instance because you were able to see things that others weren't. And also mm-hmm. strategic thinking themed strengths humans, uh, which I don't I don't have those in my in my top 10 strengths. Many times, if you don't have them, you're not thinking all the steps ahead always. And so I think you using your strengths um, in that way for your family has been uh, beautiful to see. And I think, too, what I heard, the gold that I heard in what you said is you had also time allotted. Uh, and mm-hmm. yes, it was to spend time with him. But I think I think that's really takeaway number one from interviewing you mm-hmm. is, do you have the time set aside? Are you time blocking time with your loved ones to where you can have conversations around certain things? And so I, being intentional about your time is, is so important. Mm-hmm. So that was super yeah. wise that you did that. It absolutely so. was. You know, and, and during those times, um, I had this, I had the situation where my best friend from, childhood we're still like super super close today um when we were seniors in high school my dad was diagnosed with parkinson's her mom was diagnosed with um really aggressive melanoma that was in her brain at the same almost within a month of each other Mm. and her mom passed away in six months and my dad made it 23 years and so i i had the gift of us being really close and and being able to pull from wisdom from her to say, like, what do you wish you would have asked? Or what mm. things do you wish you would have known? And so something I would say, if you are spending time with a loved one and you are gifted the gift of any amount of time, whether it's three weeks, six months, or 23 years, um, something I wish I had done sooner was take more pictures, more video, and especially more audio. Like, I have voicemails saved. And I know that sounds mm. really trivial, but it is awesome to have in hindsight. And, you know, some of the questions that I wish I would have, like that I did ask that helped me a ton were questions A around like, you know, do we have long-term care insurance? Do you have long-term care insurance? Do you have life insurance? What kind of insurance is it? Who is the insurance agent? Like some estate planning questions. And if you go to like, we had a whole series called Her Rich Life and we have an entire like one of those courses dedicated to the estate planning side. Um, But that really was a pay it forward to the questions that were really helpful when we went through kind of that process with a couple of my team member spouses, but also my dad. And then I think you get into like some of the nitty gritty questions, Sarah, like, and it, it, like, it's not fun to ask, but like, um, you know, if, if you were to uh, like have dementia and I can't take care of you in the home anymore, what do you want me to do? Like, what is the Mm. loving thing to do? Um, Mm. If your care is eroding the care of mom because she is like, like what happens with like a a sick loved one is like they, they spend so much of their time taking care of the other person that they don't have time to take care of themselves. And that Mm. happens as a child taking care of them. That happens as a spouse or partner taking care of somebody. And so at a certain point, you have to make a quality of life decision of like, 
this one person's care could also take down one or two other people at the same time. Um, and so you have to really decide, like, at what point do you need elevated care? At what point do you need help in the home? At what point do you need a facility that's more sophisticated and experienced than you are in that? Um, and I think having those conversations with my dad, like, just realistically of, like, I want you to stay in the house as long as possible. There may be a time when that's not realistic. Are you going to be okay with that? How do you want me yeah. to talk to you about it? Like, mm. how do you want me to, what do you want me to look for? in a place um mm. what's important to you about that like just understanding so when the time did come I felt like it was a really hard decision to make but we had had some conversations where at least I knew when he was more with it he understood that that might be an inevitability and it wasn't like a a surprise so it, it alleviated some of the guilt so I guess what I could say to that is have some of the harder conversations and have them a couple times when your loved one is really with it because it makes having the difficult decisions when maybe they're not as with it much easier and you don't live with the guilt. It's still hard, but you don't live with the guilt with it, yeah. which is really helpful. Yes. So take, a, take away number two, right, is having conversations when they are healthier, mm -hmm. um, if it's possible. Mm -hmm. And then take away number three, what I'm hearing is asking, having a list of questions. Now, did you go, mm -hmm. did you work through like a list that you already had or how did that go? You know what? I we can actually probably put a bunch of these in the show notes if you guys okay. want. Um, I that didn't would be have awesome. I didn't have any great guidance on this. Um, I wish I could say like I had a sensei that was helping me, but I think it was at different phases. I leaned on different people that I knew had been through experiences, and so like Anna Kruger had been through the loss of her mom, and she was the caregiver. And so like when Dad was close mm. to the end, I called her, being like, "What do you wish you had done? What are you glad mm. you did? How would you handle it?" differently or what did what are you thankful you did um when we had to admit him into memory care um, we had to find someone that could do parkinson's and memory care which was like uber tricky and i called my dad's best friend whose wife was pretty far in dementia and asked her like what did you do well what did you not do well and he was like actually i feel like i didn't do any of that well so if i could do it differently this is what i would have done completely differently so i think we all like ask for help, I think would be the big piece of that. And I'm happy all, you know, to, to help on my end, we'll put the questions that, that I over time asked my dad and I've asked my mom and Nick and I have talked about now. Um, but I think it's too, just don't be afraid to ask other people. It's a really taboo topic. And mm -hmm. I think we need to talk about it more because it's, it's something that we're all going to be dealing with in one way, shape or form and, and dealing with it with care and empathy and love um, and mindfulness ahead of time saves so much grief on the back end. Um, so true. and so we'll, we'll give you some of those questions that we asked, cause I think that would be really helpful, um, to be able I love to pull that, that so forward. So asking, asking, um, questions ahead of time. So important. What else do you feel like you, you did mm -hmm. well through this process? Um, I think I, I listened to my gut really well. I think I really mm. tried to pay attention in the moment and listen to my gut when we were hitting different milestones. And so like, you know, as somebody is terminally ill that you hit, there are scientific like points of which the body declines. And regardless of what illness it is, like talking to the nursing staff and asking them for clues, like really being curious about that, I think really helped me in mentally preparing. Um, and then the second part of that was because Sarah, you mentioned earlier, I am strategic. I always asked myself the question of what is the one thing I could do today that will save me stress, angst, grief, time, whatever it is on the back end. And mm. so when he started really declining, it was like, okay, let's go pre like preemptively interview six different places. So when we get to the point that we need to make that decision for him, we have it narrowed down to our favorite two spots and we know that that would be it. Or um, like when he was at the end, I knew that like we had a certain amount of time left and writing his eulogy was the most important thing for me, but also I knew it would be the hardest. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to do that ahead of time so that when the moment came, I wasn't having to think about all the operational things that you don't want to do, but you have to do in those moments. And so I really tried to get ahead of a lot of that type of work. Um, so that I could be more present and more engaged in the moment. And I think the other part of that too is your work still needs you. Yeah, and let's talk about like that. that. That's hard. Yeah. yeah. Let, like, let's, yes. Let's go into that. I mean, you are an empire builder. <laughs> yeah. 
you're you're mm-hmm. an empire builder. Uh, you are lead one of the top teams in Dallas. Uh, you also, of course, are a mom, a wife, all at the same time, and uh, yeah. you were very involved in uh, your dad's care. So, how did you do, how did you do yeah. all of that? I mean. I wish I could say that I did it and got like a gold star. I feel like I I basically got the t-shirt instead. <laughs> like I don't know about that. I can't say it was like it, you know, it, would I go back and want to repeat that process? Probably no. Like, you know, they always say, "Oh, well, I'm so glad I went through that." You know, I would I would do it again. I learned so much. I'm like, mm, I think I'd have a hard pass on that. I would not like to go and do that again. <laughs> um, but I will say that um, you all gave me a lot of permission around um, when you are an empire builder, you are building a big business. And sometimes you have to understand that there is going to be a season where, yes, you will still have a big business and you have something big going on in your personal life that is going to cause a season where maybe your business doesn't grow by as much or maybe you take a slight step back for a year or two. That doesn't mean that's, that is your identity. That doesn't mean that's your mm-hmm. story. Um, but it's a season. And so, you know, kind of midway through that, you all just saying like, hey, it's, o- it's okay. We give you permission to understand this is a season. And I know it's driving you crazy that you're not achieving 100% of what you want to be doing. And you also have 20 to 30% of your time right now that is having to be dedicated to something completely different. Yeah. Um, and that was, that was really huge for me. That was really huge because I, I had never, um, ever conceived the idea of like, oh, it's okay to take a step back for a second. Um, so that was, that was really important for me. And I wish I had discovered that probably a year and a half sooner. Um, but it, it was really, really helpful, really helpful for me. So, so at times, I mean, we talk a lot about counterbalance on, on this podcast and also through, mm-hmm. through her, be- her best life. And I think that this is a perfect example of that, right? It's like, it's a season. Yeah. So at times our business and or the other parts of our life need to not be as big of a priority and or yes, they still have to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but your time spent on it mm-hmm. at, isn't as great as spending with your loved one and, and preparing for that. And so I think yeah. um, all of our listeners need permission, no matter what season you are in life. I mean, our podcast mm-hmm. is about building a big business, and at the same time, having a bigger life. And so, That's so right. much of that is leaning into counterbalance and giving permission to understand this is. is a season you're in. And you did that so well. Um, mm-hmm. And I think your team supported you in that as well, which I was amazing. They were tremendously supportive. And um, they had so much empathy. I think hiring people that um, mm. are empathetic people and... and uh, I, I'm also very fortunate that several of our leaders in our organization, we've been together, you know, 13, 16, 19 years now together. Mm. Um, we've grown up together in a lot of ways. And so I think they understood probably much more wisely than I did even sort of the, the moment I was in and gave me a lot of grace. And I think as an empire builder, you've got to give yourself some grace in that too. Um, something I wish I had done better that I, I didn't do well, um, that I'm, I'm, it's actually my word for this year was, um, really creating boundaries, um, boundaries Mm. around my calendar, boundaries around my time. I time blocked well, and I, I didn't have any great boundaries though. I said yes to too many things. I, um, I, I really struggled to juggle like the personal and the, and the date nights and the health and the. And the business, like it just bled over everywhere. Um, and I wish I had been better about like learning boundaries earlier. That's actually what I'm really working hard on now um, is to learn how to establish those. Uh, but that that was a real struggle, a real struggle. And I, I was able to keep my body movement going, which was, I think, a, a huge saving grace and yes. be able to keep that going. Like it just between the personal, the work and the dad's health, it, the schedule is just so crazy. And you know, those of you out there dealing with this, you understand that like, you can't time it when a loved one falls or you can't time it when you have to go interview facilities, it just has to happen. And so the, your boundaries just get completely overrun. And I wish I could have like been proactive and going back to my schedule to say that this is a hot mess right now. And these six hours this week, whatever happens, I'm just, 
my phone's off and it's protected and these things are important too and I've got to get those done. So that's something I didn't do well that I wish I could pay it forward to somebody else um, to, so, to take so whatever that the priorities are for them and make sure they're protected. Is that the tactical like sort of how point here in terms of having so. yeah. safe, like having protected time for yourself? Is that what I'm hearing? Mm-hmm. It could be protected time for yourself. It could be date night protected. It could be like for me, mm. I would always get up before everybody else was up in the morning and go take the dog on a long walk or run. So I was getting my health in first. Um, but for other people, maybe that's more of a struggle. And so I think it's understanding like we talk about so much and like your personal circles. Um, yeah. The business for me, I had very time blocked and I had time with our daughter, very time blocked, but like you know, our marriage was always spent focusing on everybody else. Um, mm. Even in our date nights, it was focused on everybody else. And so we're working really hard to like have that time for our reconnection. And, and not that we were like strained yes. by any means, but like it was just stressful. Um, yeah. So I think that and like engaging a counselor sooner, probably some mental health sooner um, would have mm. been really nice to have protect, protected earlier in the process. And I was saying, if you're not protecting your health, like your personal wellness, that needs to be in part of that schedule. That one for me wasn't as hard, but there are people that let that go because they're taking care of somebody else in that process. So I would say that needs to be in that protected time as well. So ensuring, um, yes, you're taking time to ask questions, you're taking time to prepare, and at the same time, it's, I mean, I know we say it all the time, but it is such an ox oxygen mask um, analogy here, right? It's like you, yes, your loved one, if, if something happened to say her health in the midst of this, can you imagine, right? If she wasn't taking mm -hmm. care of mm -hmm. her body, so making sure that, but then all of the circles of our, of our life, making sure that that's a priority, especially those key relationships. And so yeah. um, what other l lessons and or anything else that you wish that you would have done different? Yeah. You know, there's two other things that I can think of that are really important. I think the first one is um, giving yourself permission to seek joy in the midst of massive amounts of pain is really, it's a weird thing to talk about. But I think when you are in it with a loved one um, and everything just feels really hard, it's very hard to kind of suck your head up above the clouds and say, I am going to chase joy or I am going to carve out time to take a vacation or to take a, a day for myself. And um, like during all of this is when we bought our, our lake house up in Michigan, right? And yeah. did all of that in the middle of everything. And that brought us so much joy and peace and just the ability to clear your head for a little bit and I have a family member, my sister lives in Colorado and she's amazing. And so at first we didn't know how to work together and how to juggle this. And she was feeling guilt of not being here on the ground. And I was working hard not to feel resentment that she wasn't here helping me. Um, mm. And so, but she just didn't know how to insert, right? And so we ended up finding a groove where I could schedule out like vacations or time that I wanted to go and chase joy and, and go travel or go do things with our family. And she was really awesome at saying, like, if you need me, schedule me out and I will come and be all in during that time. And so learning how to ask for help, learning how to engage her in a way that was meaningful for her. She could work from here in, in Dallas and we could go chase joy um, gave us just this mm. great opportunity, number one, to appreciate each other and what we were bringing to the table. But it also gave her a tangible way to contribute without me feeling like I wasn't getting help because I would say, okay, yeah. can you come in town and work from here these two weeks, right? And then she'd say, yes, I can commit to doing that. I will block that on my schedule right now. I'd say, okay, great. And then I could be totally out of the mix for the care during that time. Um, and so that was, you know, just the lesson there is ask for help, but also, you know, yes. scheduling out the time to go, to go chase joy and to refresh and to fill your energy up because you can't pour from an empty cup. And so just not feeling like you need to be the sacrificial lamb in that process um, and giving yourself permission to find people that can come in, whether you have to hire them or whether it needs to be a, a loved one or a family member or friend to come help, um, really, I think, saved us a ton, especially in the last two years, uh, to be able to carve that time out to make some memories too. 
I think we would have been really up a creek if we hadn't done that. Yeah, and, and that took you time to figure that piece out, right? I think um, I was oh, yeah. with my team, team yesterday. You know, we judge ourselves by our intentions, but we judge others by our by their actions, right? Absolutely. And and so much of intentions has to do with communication. Um, and so I I remember the the week that you had a very intentional conversation of sharing what you needed in terms of help. Mm-hmm. And I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, if anything, our listeners need to hear that more than anything, right? It's like, don't go through this by yourself. Yep. Ask for help. Tell your loved, your other loved ones, tell your family, tell your friends what you need. Because one thing I know about, <laughs> like I struggle in this area as a friend and family member in terms of um, figuring out what someone needs. Oh, yeah. Uh, and like acts of service is low on my mm-hmm. love language. So meaning like I'm not thinking of those things naturally. But if a t- if a family member tells me like I need, I need this you from to do you this. or yeah, yes. Like I will jump on mm-hmm. it and do whatever is needed. Mm-hmm. And your family don't assume they know. Don't assume they know Mm-mm. how to help. Um, yeah. So share share how to help. Mm-hmm. That's so good. I love that. That's so good. You know, and, and don't suffer in silence. I think that's mm. the other thing, too, is like at the very beginning, I, uh, Via mentioned something when we were at one of our last retreats about like you kind of had this murder syndrome a little bit where it was like I just kind of like dove in and like didn't really talk about it and just like, Whoa, like this is just insane, but I'm not going to talk about it. We're just going to pretend that this isn't like awful <laughs> right now. And um, I was suffering in silence and I was completely mm. stressing myself out. And I think learning, and my love language is acts of service, right? So when somebody like is on fire, like I'm there with like a wet blanket and I've got like a hose and I have like like all these weird contraptions. You You're like, why was that all, why is that in your backpack? Why did you bring all of that in your backpack? Um, and so for me, that came very naturally in chaos to just acts of service jump in. Um, but then that also allowed me to almost suffer in silence in a way that wasn't healthy. And I think if left unchecked, I probably would have ended up with some health, bigger health issues because of the stress mm. that was prolonged on there. Um, and I, I do believe stra- prolonged stress does cause, cause, you know, cause major health issues. And so having that conversation with my sister and saying, I am really struggling in how to engage and wanting you to feel like a part of our family and this process. And I know it's got to be hard being at a distance. And I just don't know how to pull you in. And we kind of really had this great, probably hour-long brainstorm session of what that could look like. Um, I think allowed her to feel like she was contributing in a meaningful way. Like you were telling me, Sarah, like, tell me how yeah. to help. Um, yes. And I think it allowed me, being an acts of service person, to understand how to ask for help. Um, in a way that didn't feel like a burden to them. Um, and so that was, that was a huge gift and it carried through when we were planning his, um, uh, like after he passed, the first thing people always tell you when somebody passes away is, well, let me know if I can do anything. And the hardest part about that is you're like in it. You're like, I don't know. I don't know what you could do. I have no idea. And so if you have somebody that's going through a really hard time, the best thing you can do to show up as a friend or family member for them is to say, can I do one of these three or four things for you? Like, can I help with communication? Can I help design something Mm. for you? Could I help bring you a meal? Can I help just come sit and watch a movie with your kid to give you some time to walk or whatever it is, right? It doesn't matter yeah. I'm just giving examples, but showing up with ideas for how you can contribute when somebody is in a really chaotic time um, allows them to receive help in a way that feels good to you too. Um, and the other thing that I did was I went through and made a whole list of his like um, celebration of life. And I tried to go ahead proactively to make the guest list of like, if we were throwing a big wine party for my dad, which is what we did for his celebration of life, um, who would he want there? And so I tried to get the names, the contact information. And then if somebody had like a superpower, Mm. go ahead and write that out beside of their name. And so when then they would say, well, how can I help? I would say, oh, Jeff, you actually are fantastic with wine. Can you help me buy the wine? Or, oh, this person, you know, somebody at a catering company, can you help with the food ordering? And so I already had ways to ask for help and not be Mm. like stuck in the moment. And it was a really good thing that we did um, that allowed people to feel like they were contributing, included, 
and 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 contributing in a way that was a gift for them because they did it easily and it made me so much less stressed in the month after he passed away when we were kind of coordinating all of that to feel like everyone was in their strength zone and doing the part that they could to contribute and I didn't have to carry it all. So my, my conversation with my sister really allowed for that gift after he passed away then to, to engage everybody in a meaningful way, which is really helpful. I, I love that. So so much of what you're sharing applies to so many things in our life. Yeah, right? it does. Uh, in terms of our relationships with those that, those that we love. It has been um, such a, a joy. It sounds strange using that word, mm-hmm. but but mm-hmm. it's been a joy uh, watching you lead your family um, during this time. And um, I've learned a lot fr- from you. And I appre- what I love about you amongst many things is your um, when you do learn something, you are always the first to say, let's share it with other people. And this was yeah. uh, such a, a, a treat to interview you in terms of this topic that's not talked about a lot and so many takeaways. Um, and it has just been uh, phenomenal watching you um, build your empire and, and at times keeping your empire going. And at the same time, uh, a big part of your life is being an amazing daughter. Mm-hmm. And you are... Thank you. You were friend. an amazing daughter to your dad and you are an amazing <laughs> daughter to your mom. And it's just been a joy watching that. So thank you for allowing me to interview you today, Say. Thank you. And being my friend and uh, just someone I learned so much from. And I hope our listeners got a lot out of today. We will share as much of the questions as many of the things we mentioned in the show notes. Yeah. Feel free to reach out mm-hmm. to us. And we are always one of the first to run towards topics that others don't want to talk about. So if you have another one that you want us to tackle, (laughs) let us know about that as well. Uh, But continue to have a big business and remember that taking care of our loved ones is part of that big life as well. Bye guys. Love it. Bye guys.